uh, did, uh, like we did last week, we will use um, Slido to take questions for this session. Uh, the Slido code is HB3, or if you prefer to use the chat function on Zoom, that's absolutely fine. I, I don't care either way. Um, I'm really delighted that um, Kurt is our speaker today because we have a topic that is um, not about uh, built heritage. And I think consciously or unconsciously in New Zealand, where we, we do think of historic heritage, many of us instinctively uh, start thinking about built heritage. But of course, that, that's an important part of our heritage, but it's only uh, one part. So archaeology and especially maritime archaeology is a really important aspect of our heritage. And needless to say, as an island nation, uh, maritime archaeology is so important, but occasionally gets overlooked. Um, and I guess when you think about the fact that us or our ancestors, pretty much most of us came here via the sea one way or another, either, either in an ocean going walker 800 years ago or in a government assisted passage last century sometimes. So, so the sea is such a fundamentally important to us as a nation and as um, defining us as a nation. Um, and so uh, certainly maritime archaeology is getting a higher uh, presence in New Zealand, um, due in no small part to the very, very fine work of Dr. Kurt Bennett and also Dr. Matt Carter, who are both waving the flag for maritime archaeology like anything. Um, so yeah, uh, at this stage, I'll pass over to Kurt. And um, Kurt, thanks so much for talking to us. Over to you. Thanks, Mary. Kia ora kato. Um, yes, sorry. <laughs> sorry about the fire drill excuse. Um, wasn't my fault. I do want to give this presentation. Um, was that sort of my dog ate the homework excuse? Um, but we're all good. So I will share my screen and we'll start. Oh, no, have I done this correctly? No. Nope. Sorry was working before okay yep all right. yep you're good to That's go Kurt. Good. thank you excellent all right so yeah as mary touched on um be talking with a we're speaking to the maritime archaeology theme here um and specifically addressing um new zealand shared maritime cultural heritage with that i'll be um, incorporating or using a case study, the HMS Buffalo, which I've been working um, on for the past sort of, oh, maybe four or five years now. It was included into my PhD study as one of the primary case studies, but also a continuation um, with uh, other colleagues, Matt Gainsford, who's a maritime archaeologist, and Rebecca Cox, who's the manager of the Mercury Bay Museum. So we developed the HMS Buffalo re-examination project to um, basically involve the, the local community and in looking and recording um, their underwater cultural heritage. But I'll be using the buffalo just to illustrate um, one example of New Zealand's shared maritime cultural heritage. So I'll just make sure I'm just presenting on behalf of um, the HMS Buffalo re-examination project here too. So to give, give a bit of a wider context, New Zealand's maritime cultural landscape, we're an island nation. Um, it was one of the last major land masses in the world to be settled by humans. Um, first sort of wave came in or around 1250 to 1300 AD um, by Polynesian peoples. And then second mass wave um, followed with uh, by Europeans after sort of 1769 when Cook charted um, New Zealand. Maritime archaeological remains relating to Maori culture include waka landings, fish weirs or fish traps, navigation markers, and inundated settlements and sunken waka. The Pākehā archaeological remains include shipwreck, shipwreck graveyards, military sites, wharves, navigation mask markers, ballast dumps, and slipways, just to mention a few there. There's apparently um, Around 1,500 um, documented shipwrecks in New Zealand with approximately 10% relocated. This number, um, the number of documented shipwrecks I've seen has been quoted up to 2,500. So I guess we're still staring a bit blind there. Perhaps um, someone can really 
nail down that number um, to really help us understand what we're dealing with. But I mean, that shipwreck site Pacific, uh, specific, sorry, and um, that doesn't include like any other uh, sites that I've just mentioned there. But as you can see, New Zealand, um, yeah, we're an island nation. We got here by watercraft, all of us basically, until recently in the last sort of 50 years, perhaps by aircraft. Um, but we've all got a connection to the sea and this is where our maritime heritage is really important. So to introduce the case study for today, HMS Buffalo. It was built in 1813 in Calcutta, India. Um, it's written down in historical records as built of teak. Its purpose was a merchantman, so transport of people and goods. Its original name when it came off the stocks was Hindustan, and then pretty much immediately changed to uh, Buffalo um, with the purchase by the Royal Navy. Its length is, I'll just leave it at 36 metres there, um, by about 10 metres in beam, so the width of the vessel. And it's not big um, by today's standards. So I, I sort of try and compare it to the Indore Island of Ferry. Um, those sitting around about 300 feet or around just over um, about 100 metres in length. And I always say that um, if you're ever passing through Picton, go and stop at the Edwin Fox Museum because you can actually go and stand on a similar size vessel to the Buffalo, about 10 metres longer. But then when you're standing on it, you can look out to the Rental Island of Ferry and you can really um, gauge the difference in size. These vessels were not big. Literally just small little bathtubs roaming the ocean, and um, yeah, the, the, the people sailing on them, um, they had guts, really. Um, so full complement of crew of 93. Uh, so again, quite a few few people in a small space. And as I said, it was bought by the British Admiralty as a store ship. I'll just highlight sort of the last decade um, leading up to its wrecking and the voyages in which it um, participated in. And we'll start with uh, in 1831 to 1832, it was a quarantine ship during the European cholera epidemic. So it's quite fitting for today's um, context. And then it was moved, repurposed as a convict ship, sailing um, women convicts and their children um, to Western, oh, sorry, to Sydney. And then, of course, to try and make the voyage profitable, it would come back via somewhere and either load up other um, people or um, goods. And in this case, it would sail via New Zealand and load Kauri spars for the British Admiralty. Because, uh, the, yeah, being Kauri trees were very tall, straight, um, perfect for masts and spars. In 1836, transported 173 immigrants to settle in Adelaide and carrying, it was captained by John Hindmarsh, who became the um, first governor of the province there. So it was one of that first wave of European settlers to South Australia. In 1837, uh, became a timber ship sailing to New Zealand, doing that sort of route between India, um, Australia, New Zealand, and, and circling back. Then it became a troop ship uh, in 1839, sailing from England to Canada with 291 troops, uh, one lady, 12, sorry, I've got one lady in there, but I'm uh, sorry, 12 women and seven children on board and passengers. And then sort of in a return voyage, but not quite, it, um, it was known as the Patriot Voyage from Canada to Sydney, and it transferred 141 political prisoners involved in the Canadian Rebellion. And there's still um, cultural heritage attached to those prisoners. They worked on the, the Parramatta Road, which is still there today. Um, so it's still sort of carved into the landscape, um, that voyage. We were April 1840, where the, the vessel um, arrived in New Zealand and sailing with Lieutenant Governor Hobson's wife and children and household servants. And Thomas Laslett, who's timber purveyor, he's also got fantastic journals um, about some of his voyages to New Zealand around this time, some great sketches too. So um, some yeah, really useful records there. And also Major Bunbury and a detachment of troops. And then the same year in, in July, um, and on the 28th of July, it became a shipwreck in Mercury Bay after its third visit to New Zealand. 
So the Reckon event itself, um, it was anchored in Mercury Bay, just off Cook's Beach. And this anchorage was known to mariners um, because Cook uh, plotted this anchorage on his early map. Um, so others visiting the bay knew it was safe, or relatively, as we go on to see. Um, but uh, so here was a buffalo, Captain Wood at the helm, um, and then July 24th, with a wind shift to the southeast, heavy rain and uh, squalls, uh, Wood, Wood decides to return to his anchorage. And there he settles um, to try and hopefully ride out the storm. July 27, a heavy easterly swell has developed. And this bay gets, just from my personal experience, gets hammered by easterly swells all the time. So he's experienced this now. Uh, we've got three watches set and axes are issued to cut away the sheet anchor. So the main anchor there, um, if necessary. And then July 28th, the storm develops even bigger and, and greater. And it's described actually in the journal as hurricane strength. So the, the buffalo has been battered already on its mooring um, and we've got a strong easterly gale now. So you've got um, basically wind and swell um, working against you and the vessel. 5 a.m. the anchors are lost. 6.30 a.m. Um, the ship's bouncing around the bay. It strikes off Shakespeare Point. Um, that's around the, sorry, if, if you look at the image, the third ship along to the right. I don't know if you can see my mouse there. You so were we're, thinking. We're, okay, so we're talking, yeah. So it's already been pushed around the bay. Um, and it, at that point in time, it loses its rudder. And now Captain Wood basically has no steering, um, no real control of the ship apart from the sails. And this is um, quite marvelous in itself, very um, highlights his skill set, really. Uh, he manages to actually back it into what they described as the stream, so the mouth of the, the river there. Um, so to, as today, that's where like the marina is and the ferry travels across. Um, so he backs it in there and actually lowers down um, a kedge anchor to try and just sort of find shelter in the stream, but loses that too, and then just makes way for the beach, um, driving the boat up um, onto what is now Buffalo Beach. So at 9.15, the boats are lowered for crew and the captain resets the sails to force the boat up. So that's coming back from the stream there. And around midday, um, Nati Hay assists with the rest of the crew um, to get safely to shore. So, so they swam out a rope, tied that to shore, and that provided a safety line which um, sailors could come across. Unfortunately, two men drowned. But if you think about the, the complement of crew normally needed to sail a vessel like that, um, it's not a bad result, I would say. And they also, I'll just add too that then they set up a survivor's camp um, close to shore there. So the final wrecking location, just to put it in context, so this is actually from um, a navigational chart. And so this is accurate as opposed to the previous image, but just shows how close it is to shore. And this, this image, um, the satellite image actually shows that high tide. So at low tide, you're looking about 50 to 80 meters um, from shore that you could, you could actually almost walk all the way out to the shipwreck. It's that shallow. Um, normally it sits in that sort of two to three meter depth range. Um, you can snorkel it if you've got a good breath hold, uh, but otherwise, uh, yeah, strap on a tank and you get to explore it with a bit more time. And I'll just point this out to this. Um, this is Mercury Bay on a good day. And just keep this in the back of your mind for a, a, there's a later slide, which I'll compare it to. Uh, the image on the left is a current memorial that's set up on the beachfront. It's actually a little bit off. Uh, it's not directly in front of the shipwreck site. Um, but there's a bit of information about the sailors that drowned, a bit about the ship. Uh, the anchor is not from the site, but it gives you <laughs> a little bit of a maritime feel there. And it does actually point you um, in a relative direction. The GPS coordinates aren't correct as well. I'll just point that out, but <laughs> um, just to be very critical with there. Uh, the photo on the, on the right, uh, just illustrating again, beautiful day of what can be experienced in Mercury Bay. Uh, and there's two little black spots out there. It's Matt Gainsford and I, uh, we've swum out to the site. So this is at high tide. So it's a bit more of a swim, um, but that gives you an idea roughly where the, the shipwreck is. Now, the HMS Buffalo Reexamination Project uh, is not the first, 
even though we're doing an archaeological survey, it's not the first time that we that an archaeologist or a maritime archaeologist has visited the site. And just think back to those voyages in the last decade leading up to the wrecking event. Um, it's, it's connected with so many nations. And South Australia had an interest in it in 1986. Yes, 1986. It was the 150th year um, jubilee there. And so we've got Bill Jeffrey pictured in the, in the news article there. He was the state maritime archaeologist and <laughs> later a lecturer for me at Flinders University. Um, but yeah, so he and a team actually uh, made up of um, government maritime archaeologists as well as local volunteers from South Australia came over and with, with the permit as well, also excavated the shipwreck site. So they wanted to, I guess, uh, yeah, research and, and look at what the site is, also relocate it so that we've got it on plans, um, but also excavate down for some artifacts and sort of bring that tangible heritage um, back to Adelaide and which they did they actually transferred uh, some of the artifacts that they excavated and they still uh, remain in South Australia today but with that they produced a site plan so this is the first detailed site plan of the site um, you would see uh, the this oh sorry the excavation squares here and a trench um, down near the bow this is the bow end so the beach the beach is facing down the bottom of the screen. Uh, yeah, so they, they excavated down only a certain area. Uh, at this stage, the wreck was covered in sand in quite a, a substantial depth. So they had to bring in a water dredge, excavate out the sand, and then record uh, what they came across. They also established a rough site extent uh, with that dotted line. So just indicating that, hey, we've got actually quite a bit of the wreck still preserved below the sea floor. And this is how our sort of knowledge of the site remained. Until recently, um, I was doing my PhD working at the Mercury Bay Museum with Rebecca and I was looking at the items that have already been salvaged and also I was recording those. And during this time, we sort of developed a, um, a chat around maybe we need to further this project and, and look at the site itself. And so, Matt Gainsford arrived back from Sweden after spending some time there working as a maritime archaeologist and we got chatting and uh, yeah, we're basically all on the same line. We want to promote maritime archaeology in New Zealand. How best to do that? We've got a really accessible shipwreck site here. We've got some um, base research that was done a few years ago and from that we sort of developed the um, project. So in 2008, we went for a dive Oh, sorry, 2018, sorry, we, we um, went for a, a dive and discovered that the site was actually being scoured out. So in 1986, you think it was covered in sand. Now today, it's not. Um, for whatever reason, natural um, environmental processes happening in the bay has to, um, left the shipwreck exposed. But where this might be seen, like deemed as... Um, I say maybe uh, an issue to the or threat to the site. It was actually an opportunity because it meant that we don't ha we didn't have to go and excavate down. Um, didn't have to apply for a permit to go through the sea floor, but we could go and record as much as we could and in greater detail than they did in 1986. So we went for a dive on the site, and hopefully this starts. And just to give you an idea um, how it was in 2018. And this is on a good day, by the way. Don't think it's beautiful uh, diving. Uh, this is, yeah. But what, yeah, what we're seeing here, uh, the frames sticking out. So there's those things jutting out from the sea floor. We've got some ceiling planking running longitudinal along there. You'll notice a lot of um, muscle growth as well. So it's been exposed for a relatively long time for that sort of uh, marine life to colonize the wreck. And it's actually becoming that sort of artificial reef in itself so it's not just heritage we're talking marine biodiversity as well so it's a really dynamic and great site to um dive on the and then so leading into the project we, we went in with a few aims here um one we wanted to survey and accurately map the exposed hull structure so building on that 1986 um site plan and really taking this opportunity it's fully exposed we want to understand what the full um, site extent is 
and then using these records and recordings um, to hopefully build into some sort of future management plan and of course increase that public interpretation at the Mercury Bay Museum. Uh, second there was um, record the site using both manual and modern digital recording techniques. So there's a, a relatively new sort of tech or software called photogrammetry. I'm sure most of you will be aware of it, but it's basically you collect thousands of photos and then you end up building um, a 3D model. But on that note, we wanted to use both a uh, manual, um, tradition, more traditional recording technique in maritime archaeology because, and this involves tape measures and recording the slates. And this is because we want to involve the community. We want to get the, we want to get divers in there looking at the wreck, not just behind a camera taking heaps of photos. We want them to fully appreciate what they're recording and how they're doing it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, water delivery. Um, and then, so the third one, uh, we wanted to sample the site as well to understand the vessel's construction, and then also build up that material reference catalog for the Mercury Bay Museum. Four, we wanted to increase the awareness of maritime archaeology and history, both regionally and nationally. Maritime archaeology in New Zealand is incredibly underdeveloped. Uh, there's only three of us that are trained with the, the skill set. It's not taught on any tertiary level. Uh, we have a very small number of groups that perhaps go through um, association training, such as AMNS courses, but it's generally really not known about. So we want to build that capacity. Five, we want, we want to promote the public outreach and community engagement. We want to get people involved. We want to get them um, passionate about their underwater cultural heritage. And it's not just that sort of older age group, we want to engage with the, the school kids as well. So that next generation coming through, because that's that will bring change. Uh, so number six, connect with local, regional and national agencies through the project. And so we want to get that support going, just again, building that awareness and capacity. Uh, seven, make available the project's finding to the wider public. So doing um, talks like this, conferences, both um, professional conferences as well as public and also publishing. So we've published in the Heritage New Zealand Quarterly, um, other association newsletters and things like that. And number eight there, um, recommend future site management and preservation strategies. So the data that we extrapolate out of our, our survey, our research, hopefully that we are taken up by, um, yeah, management authorities and stakeholders and, and really start to do a bit more with the rec. So the survey, the underwater survey that we conducted, uh, was on between the, over a weekend, so the 12th and 13th of March um, last year, fortunately we had the green light from COVID and we, we advertised for divers just through um, dive clubs, through universities um, and other um, professional bodies as well. And we had relatively good feedback. We had 12 divers total. So we, and of, of different, of a range of age, I should say, and also um, experience, diver experience. We, we didn't say, we didn't veto anyone. We didn't, um, yeah, we didn't want, we wanted everyone to be involved, no matter what your background was. And so we divided them up into six groups of um, two diving pairs and we gave them each a quadrant. And you'll see the map, the site plan there, this is how we broke it up. So the red dashed line is the baseline in which we set across along the keel. And then two divers would work a sort of a 10 meter length of that baseline. And that was the area for the weekend. So that's what they concentrated on. And then from that, we're doing about three dives a day, yeah, 65 tanks of air and 85 hours underwater. Sorry, I'll just go back and I'll just point out, and this, this shows you the visibility on, on the day. So not always as good as it was in that video. Um, and the tools that we're using, Real basic, slate, underwater paper, uh, pencil and tape measure. And this is what we produce. So again, so we wanted to use both manual and digital um, tech for recording the wreck. So the two dimensional uh, or the lines drawing there, that's the site plan that the volunteers created, which is fantastic. Um, so much more information. We can really understand a bit more about the site extent. And then we've overlaid that with parts of the photogrammetry um, which we produced. I'll just note the limitation there was the visibility. It was terrible. It was literally um, holding the camera onto the timber 
And so when you're trying to create overlap, you're, you actually end up taking a photograph of a smaller area in which you planned. But by and large, this is a lot more information in what, um, than what we had previously. And as you can see, there's a lot of the wreck still preserved. And just the top right corner, just to give you an illustration there, um, a sort of a 3D a representation. So we've got the hull sitting in the water. That's that's roughly how deep the water would have been sitting around it when it wrecked. And then with the photogrammetry with that 3D model, we can start building it in and then understanding what is actually left. Put in perspective, um, the we're talking about from the keel up to the turn of the bilge. So if you think where you, you've got the keel there and then it comes up and then just as it turns, that's the turn of the bilge. So that's what's preserved below the seafloor, which in my experience is actually quite a lot because I'm normally used to dealing with only a few timbers, but I get excited about that anyway. So you can imagine me when I was down there, um, kid in a candy shop. Right, and then what we can do with that data is that we can look at sort of roughly engage um, what the site is in a real, real landscape. So using that aerial image, uh, overlaid the 1986 site plan there, just to show you sort of what was done back then. And then we can bring in what we've done and overlay that again, and we get a um, greater understanding. So this just shows you what is actually preserved on the sea floor. And yeah, it's quite incredible. We basically got um, stem to stern along the keel. So a lot of information there that we could potentially use for future research. And the sampling that we did, we did this under an archaeological research authority. Uh, so we took three, it was wood, fiber, and metal. And wood, we, so we confirmed pretty much everything was, uh, well, we can say as a sample set, but we can say it was constructed of teak as a historical record um, acknowledged. And then also it was a layer of sacrificial planking uh, with a conifer, possibly cedar um, on the outside. And that sacrificial planking, it's cheaper wood, it's very thin and the idea was that if the ship hit a reef or anything like that it could just be ripped off but still maintaining the integrity of your main uh, outer planking which was only sort of about 100 millimeters thick so if you think about that's you between the ocean and sinking then it's um, you really want to protect it. There's fiber used in between the sacrificial planking and the outer planking and it was a matted cattle here which was heavily tarred so sort of creating a, a waterproof layer um probably i, I want to say like i think of like an early sort of form of laminate kind of um when I mean, you got wood against wood but using that sort of composite material inside in between and then metal sheathing on the outside so mostly copper uh where the was the sheathing itself and these were attached with more bronze um, sheathing tax and the sheathing there it's there um, used as sort of a chemical uh, protection against um, shipworm and so stop any sort of critters eating into the timber and creating a sort of Swiss cheese effect um, so that's sort of that technology is around the turn of that century around 1800 and then it becomes a bit more of a, a copper alloy around from 1840 onwards. And also, the, so the project wanted to promote uh, maritime archaeology and, and use what we found out from the site as well and build that into the education program. So we started off um, in the same, sorry, the weekend prior, um, we had to delay the underwater survey because of weather, but the weekend prior, we. Um, we got the local schools involved and over two days we hosted 162 students and so they came in and we we ran a 45 minute session each where the students learned about um, the ship its voyages um, the local and national and international connections and also the importance of a shipwreck from an archaeological point of view so there are different theme boards placed around the foreshore there and they're each given in teams um, especially design uh, worksheets they go around and find the answers and we had some artifacts that they could touch and and really look at and then we'll bring them all back and then we'll do a sort of a debrief and then and but it was great that we actually positioned ourselves in front of the wreck because a lot of them didn't know where it was 
And so you'd, you'd get them to turn around and say, the wreck's just there. And I've heard recently too, that you can hear kids talk to their parents as they're walking along going, did you know the wreck's just there and the parents don't? So it's fantastic that we're sort of, sort of building that um, awareness within that younger generation. And then the teachers, we're initially we're only gonna do this first one and then, but the teachers loved it so much that they're like, well, can we have a second? So <laughs> Bex and I are sort of uh, scratching our heads, but we came up with a specially designed um, exercise where they could become maritime archaeologists themselves and record their own wreck site. And so this is what we came up with. And I, I was uh, sort of borrowing this idea of a, a mate of mine, another maritime archaeologist who works in Spain. And so we got, again, get the community involved, wider community where the dive masks, um, uh, supplied by the dive shop we had i think we'd put on like fitty chat on facebook to get the skateboards in the scuba tanks are made out just two liter coke bottles spray painted yellow and the idea was um we set up a makeshift shipwreck site so a bit of like there's a ship's bell there's um the uh school kid there recording a ship knee an iron knee and so they were put into teams and they had to work together and they're only allowed two minutes because you know working underwater, you've only got a limited time. And so just getting that sort of environment and making them aware that this is what we do underwater, but it's also thinking about what are you recording, why are you recording it, working as a team, and then we'll come back to a dive de debrief, you know, talk through who, you know, what you found difficult, just as we do today. It's all it's all part of doing an underwater survey. And um, yeah, so we so we ran that with the same school groups as well. And uh, that was a success. And now the, the teachers won a third, um, which we're developing um, to be a conservation uh, sort of exercise as well. But yeah, and, and we showed them some um, video from the, the shipwreck site. So just trying to bring that back into um, the education side of it. Now, this is, this is a slide I wanted to point out. I know the ones that I showed you were beautiful and pristine, normally in Mercury Bay, but However, it gets hammered by seasonal storms. And this was in winter 2021. So, oh, sorry, last year. Um, and just that easterly swell, it's always coming in. Combination of king tides and winds and flooding, it just beefs it up and it scours away the coastline. And these, that top, top image, those are the waves breaking over the wreck site. And you think at high tide, it's between two, three meters of depth, but at low tide, those waves are just hammering the wreck site. And so the wreck is really at the mercy of, this, of these environmental processes. And this is happening every single year. And as a result of that, all these timbers started washing up on the beach. Now in the past, they often end up in people's gardens, but I'm pleased to announce that. <laughs> I, well, at least feel that the re-examination project have created enough awareness that the community has really become engaged and passionate about this shipwreck. And so they end up calling Rebecca at the museum, going, oh, I found bits on the beach. And that's fantastic because that's never happened before. Normally, as I said, it would end up in someone's garden. So it was a sort of a, a rescue recovery process over a number of days as people phoned in these bits of timber and they got delivered to the museum and, and, and went sort of into a, a sort of a storage until we got um, some funding for Matt and I to come along and then do an archeological recording of the timbers because we want to preserve the archeological information before these timbers start degrading um, beyond sort of conservation uh, treatment. So in total, we had 16 timbers collected from the beach. We also got this, the public to take photos. So like, um, context shots, we got them to take GPS readings if they could, or at least, you know, relocate them, um, because that starts building into a database that we've created, because we want to understand further the wreck, the wreck site, or the extent of wrecking, and where these bits and pieces are starting to pop out of the sand. And, sorry, and then going back to the recording, we recorded them, um, using a laser, handheld laser scanner, which Matt's got there. So we've got these recorded in three dimensions as a digital um, recording, and we've got them uh, loaded up online. So anyone can view them now. 
uh, and they're there. They're recorded as is pretty much straight out of the water. And that's fantastic because we want to record that information, yeah, again, before they degrade, but also before that conservation treatment process, which might alter or affect that sort of archaeological signature that we want to record. So that's the first sort of approach that we took to these timbers. Um, they've been in a purpose-built tank. Again, the community just rallied. Eh? A, a person came in with a digger, dug out a hole behind the museum, lined it, and then filled it with water. So it was a real, real effort by everyone, and they're still um, desalinating uh, as we speak. But it also shows that the site is under threat from natural processes, and if it should be made in order to manage it, or at least maybe do a wider um, recording of the site or have some sort of management plan in place. So in summary, um, we successfully engaged with the community to promote maritime archaeology and local underwater cultural heritage. And it's this project's ongoing as well. We're, we haven't stopped here. Um, we've developed new and exciting education programs to engage with younger generations. And we've built upon previous investigations to enhance our understanding of vessel construction, but also the site. We disseminated uh, results locally, nationally, and internationally via various conferences, um, publications. We're currently drafting up a peer reviewed journal article to go out as well. And yeah, and from our data, we've got now a greater understanding of the extent of the shipwreck site. And then using that, we can now develop more targeted research questions from an archaeological point of view and further also build that into a, a site management plan. Um, identified further work is necessary. <laughs> it's not just a shipwreck. It's, uh, as we know, it bounced all around the bay. So we want to understand that larger wrecking extent because um, we know bits and pieces got broken off. It lost its rudder, for example. And we also want to make regular site inspections to document and record those site formation processes. So what is happening in the bay? Um, it would be a great study for anyone looking at um, coastal erosion or anything like that as well. So it's not just heritage, it touches on a lot of things. We had actually one of our dive volunteers, she was a marine biologist, and she came out beaming, you know, smile ear to ear, and she said, um, it's such a cool site because it's almost like a nursery. She noticed there weren't any sort of adult fish, but more young juvenile. And so maybe that provi provides a safe haven um, for the fish life in the bay. I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a marine biologist, but she seemed to be very stoked with um, what she saw down there. So bringing it back to the theme, um, just very quickly. So HMS Buffalo, it's not the only significant um, site or maritime site in New Zealand with shared heritage. There's several, there's several other uh, sites as well, or several thousand, well, almost a thousand um, site. We don't actually know. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is just one. And to demonstrate it here, like this is touched on or connects with so many different nations around the world with various histories as well. So while we might just think, oh, it's just a shipwreck in Mercury Bay, We've got a lot of other people, other nations involved with an interest in this. And we, I know Rebecca gets um, descendants from, from either the ship or the, you know, the voyages as well that come in um, from South Australia, just that connection, just for place. They might have not had any ancestors on the ship, but they would come in and say, I'm from South Australia. And the ship was one of the first four that arrived. Um, and so anyway, I've created these columns just to very quickly, just sort of highlight a few points here. So from a shared maritime heritage point of view, um, some culture that could be investigated. We've got ship, British shipbuilding, but although it was built in India, it was built by Indian shipwrights, but under the, um, uh, under the supervision of a, a leading British shipwright. So you've got this sort of mix of possible techniques or methods involved in working with wood. Um, we've got the voyaging culture, what we can understand about this various voyages, the people on board, uh, things like that. So that could all, always come back to arch further archeological studies. It's got historical connections with several nations, including us, Ngāti Hei, and also the descendants, um, those who sailed on it. And then stakeholders as well. Um, 
British Royal Navy. It was it's their ship. Um, India. It was built in India. It's got connections to South Australia, as already demonstrated by Bill Jeffrey in 1986. It's important to them as a symbol of that first sort of arrival or colonization um, of the land, whether good or bad. I'll add there, but and then also we've got more national um, government departments. It's a protected archaeological site because it wrecked pre-1900. Uh, regional councils um, and local councils also, um, yeah, have, have, have an interest in it. So you've got heritage that's in your backyard, but it's got wider shared heritage that need, needs to be acknowledged. And also the public, the Fidianga community, um, that they sort of treat it like theirs, you know, and that's it's special to them. It's built within the landscape. It's not just the shipwreck under the water. It's, we've got Buffalo Beach, it's named after it. We've got place names. We've got uh, the schools have houses that the children relate to. We've got Buffalo House in some of the schools. So it's ingrained into the community. And so the more they get to know about it, the more they're probably going to really get behind it. And um, yeah, and just, again, share that heritage but maybe more locally so in conclusion um, the buffalo re-examination project demonstrates the importance of exploring new zealand's submerged maritime heritage and creating learning opportunities to promote new zealand's maritime culture her heritage the data collected from this it can assist not just from an archaeological perspective but again i touched on this coastal erosion studies um, marine biology studies we now have got a, we now have a material material database um, built up in the museum collection. So think if more storms happen, more timber arrives, we could take some samples and then try and ID it because we still, if those timbers wash ashore, we want to understand whether if they are from the buffalo or not, because that will come down to how we react um, to those timbers. From an archaeological perspective perspective uh, we can combine them with wider global studies focusing on British vessels especially those built in in India around a similar time we can do site formation studies on shipwrecks uh, cultural underwater cultural heritage sites we can build our data into management and protection of of this site as well as potentially others um, using it as a case study and further boost boost local interpretation and and promoting that educational output. And the last three points here, Buffalo, it's one example of a historic shipwreck in New Zealand waters with shared cultural her heritage. But the questions I sort of leave you with today is, or are, how many other shipwrecks with shared heritage are there? There's been no real assessment on this. We don't actually know the number. And what condition are they in? Uh, are they under threat? There's been no real comprehensive, I guess, examination of our underwater cultural heritage. We've got a great shipwreck book um, listing every shipwreck from 1795 to today. And that's a great reference guide, but I mean, that's just, uh, it's based on historical references, but we need to understand what we're dealing with and if we're gonna manage them better. And then touching, leading into the last point, um, it's something that, I, I think about quite often it's, it's how do we approach managing our maritime cultural heritage resource and then how does that if it's shared heritage we want to make sure that we're doing it in line with the other nations that have an interest in it um, so how how does that reciprocate with other nations and think of like war grave sites underwater uh, with shipwrecks that are we actively managing and protecting perhaps another nation's vessel in our territorial waters to the standard in which they are of our own vessels in their waters. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> um, and so based on that, um, like one example re recently is SS Ventnor. I'm not sure if you're aware, but the, the vessel that went down off the Hokianga Harbour with the Chinese miners. Um, and while that's now protected, it's almost reactionary though in what happened um, but also to that's an example of their shared cultural heritage um, and so sort of building on that it's not it's not doom and gloom but there's opportunities there um, to really build on this so I think like studies should be commissioned to assess what we currently have 
is maritime cultural heritage. Shipwrecks are a great starting point. Um, we should potentially consider ratifying the convention on underwater cultural heritage because that would bring us in line with other nations who have ratified. And then obviously that would build on that sort of reciprocal agreement or arrangement. We should consider formal agreements with other nations acknowledging our shared maritime heritage. So the Buffalo being a naval vessel, perhaps we need to get in contact with the Royal Navy, uh, English, her English historic heritage, sorry, I forgot the name, but English heritage um, and start chatting to them. How do they want us to manage or approach their heritage as well? So we get those agreements going and national and regional agencies um, yeah, I think we just need increased funding and awareness of we've got archaeological sites, we've got heritage underwater. We're an island nation. We got here by boat, majority of us, apart from the last 50 years, <laughs> as a disclaimer, but we need to start recognising that our heritage goes beyond the shoreline and it's underwater and we've got a fantastic resource there. It's unique to New Zealand um, and yeah, we need to start throwing some tools at it. So just before I end, just to acknowledge the people that are involved in the HMS Buffalo re-examination project there, this true community effort, volunteers came from Auckland, down the Kapiti Coast, across, all at their own expense, um, and really, yeah, couldn't have done it without them. And we're still continuing, we're currently working with the Royal Navy, um, doing some side scan sonar work of the bay, and yeah, more, more projects to come. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Do you want to stop um, sharing your screen yeah. so we can see some faces? Thank you. Uh, look, thank you so much for that. That's just just absolutely fascinating. And I think just the, the range of themes you touched on of um, the physical difficulty of that site management, of the cultural connections, of all of that stuff you talked about. Um, personally, I love... Um, the kids whizzing around on their skateboards um, doing that recording. That's absolutely flipping genius. That really is. <laughs> um, I've got um, two questions here that have come in on Slido. So the first one is, how accurate is sorry, photogrammetry when photos are taken underwater? Yep. Um, like we had, so we had the scale bars in there. Um, yeah, so you can scale it down, but it's... I. I've heard it can be accurate to a couple of millimetres if your imagery is good. Um, you might allow for a couple of centimetres. But in terms of what we wanted out of it, we don't necessarily need millimetres of accuracy. Um, it comes down to your research question. And I think archaeologists actually get a bit bogged down with focusing too much on accuracy sometimes. So, uh, yeah, I, I, look, it's accurate enough that yeah, we, we've uh, got a very good picture of the shipwreck. And sorry, I'm going to be cheeky and add a follow-up question. Just as a mm -hmm. diver, knowing what it can be like working in really rough water when you're getting buffeted around. Mm -hmm. So presumably it's a technique you need pretty still calm conditions for? Yes, yeah. And the buffalo site was uh, quite a challenge because it's in that sort of area, yeah, it's low water, a lot of tidal surge or sorry swell coming in so you're it's kind of like a washing machine sometimes uh ideally yeah really good visibility no swell no tide no current anything like that and the idea was that you just sit sort of mid-water and you just glide along taking photos making sure you've got about a 75 percent overlap of each um boundary of your photo how to put it um and that would be ideal uh, whereas the Buffalo site, it was you're sort of being pushed back by a meter with the tide, then you're coming back, you take your photo, and then you're trying to find where you were to ensure you've got the overlap. So it really proved challenging, but you can overcome it <laughs> if you've got patience. I've seen also too, there was, uh, there was a group of divers up in the Baltic and they were diving in just black water and they managed to produce a wonderful 3D a model of a shipwreck up there in very low light, very limited visibility. So it can be done. It's just how much time and, and patience. Yeah. Thank you. And the second question, uh, 
which authority slash organization has responsibility for maintaining these recs? Mm. Here's a curly one for you. <laughs> yes, so the, the my understanding is the rec site is Waikato Regional Council because it's underwater, whereas anything above the high water mark is uh, Thames Coromandel District Council. So you get this weird thing. So when those timbers were washing ashore, you had this weird situation that no one was willing to accept <laughs> whose responsibility it was because they, a timber could be above the high water mark, therefore it should be Thames Coromandel District Council. But if it was below, it'd be Waikato Regional Council. Um, yes, yeah, I don't know if that answers. Well, it does, and I think also just obviously flagging that the um, authority process to if anyone wants to um, invasively examine um, any maritime archaeology of whatever nature, they need to get an authority from HNZ. For sure. And then sometimes yeah. the receiver of wrecks kicks in, and I think that that's one of the complexities of maritime archaeology. There's sort of all sorts of people with fingers in, a pie, in the pie, mm -hmm. and some of them actually don't even know it's their responsibility. So yeah, that can make for fairly action-packed conversations. <laughs> That's right, yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right, well, folks, there's, oh, I beg your pardon, I think there's one new message. Um, yes, yeah, so um, a message here in the chat from, from Bill saying, um, agree that the school gym exercise is a very clever way to engage children who then go and tell their parents well done. Mm. So, yeah, absolutely. Kids, kids are often the conduit for this stuff, aren't they? And, you know, many of us will have found that, in our professional or voluntary work, that if you if you can if you can get the kids, and if you can get the kids with the hey wow going, mm -hmm. they go home and tell everybody else, and away you go. Yeah. That's so, it. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. think yeah, I think we all need to start whizzing around on skateboards. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there's there's another there's happens. another side to that as well. Like it's just exposing our next generation to different career paths as well. Um, yeah. Being a small small town as well. Yeah. I'd, Perhaps they don't have that sort of opportunity normally. And look, we, we might not get 100 maritime archaeologists, but if we get one, you know, the job done, I reckon. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Start small and then go big, and roll yeah. it out nationally. <laughs> All right, folks, um, I'll, I'll close down um, this Zoom session. Thank you so much, Kurt. That was just no fascinating. I've got, I've got serious scuba envy now. I'm sitting looking out my window at Lyle Bay and I feel like, <laughs> You know, going oh, what, what, flinging yeah. myself in and, and flailing around the place. Um, so with our Heritage Bites sessions, folks, we'll take a break next week because it is, of course, Easter. So we'll come back uh, the following Friday. So um, have a really good Easter, everybody. Thank you, Kurt. Um, and have a good afternoon. All right, Bye thank now. you.